host Alicia Bust of Horsepower Empowerment Through Connection. And today I have the fantastic pleasure of getting to hang out with my friend, Nancy Parrish Plass, who is currently located in a kibbutz in Usha, Israel. However, she is originally from Springfield, Massachusetts, and she has her master's degree in social work. She's the founder and chair of the Animal Assisted Psychotherapy Association in Israel. She has a background in cross-cultural research methodology, which I just think is super cool because I love cross-cultural research methodology, um, which a lot of people probably don't know about me, but I do. And so, Nancy, thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. And um, Nancy's also written a book, which is how I originally heard of her many years ago. And it's Animal Assisted Therapy for Theory Issues and Practice. And so she will talk to us a little bit about all of that as well. But before we get started on that fantastic journey, Nancy, can you please share with the audience for those of us who don't know uh, what a kibbutz is? Okay. Uh, a kibbutz is like a rural communal settlement in Israel. Uh, it started way before the beginning of the, of the country. Uh, it was a way for people to come and work the land. And conditions were so hard uh, back then that they just did it together. Uh, it went through a lot of changes. Uh, now it's a lot less communal, but a lot of uh, cultural events are are communal and we try to do a lot of a lot of things together and it's like a, a large rural neighborhood with lots of gardens and green places and no cars in the middle and kids you know from the time they're three years old they're running around to their friends houses and, and it's just the best educational system I could ever want for my kids awesome. and so I've been living here since uh, 1982. So that's been quite a few years now. I love it. 1982. That was two years after I was born. <laughs> and matter of fact, I came here at first in 1974, but I only moved here finally in 82. Yeah. That's fantastic. And what brought you to Usha? Um, a lot of ideology. I've always loved uh, the whole idea of Israel. I'm Jewish and just felt a very strong identity here. Awesome. And just the whole ide ideology of, of doing things together and status is not an issue here, which is very, very important for me. Um, the, it's, the people in the educational system are of the, the highest educational quality you can imagine. The kindergarten teacher here for two years was, was the uh, director of the kibbutz. Um, it, it, things like that. It's, it's, uh, nice people, and uh, I love the rural environment, all the animals around, there are horses here, okay. um, stable, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. That's really cool. And when you first came to Usha, Israel, um, they didn't have very much for animal assisted therapy yet, did they? Oh, <laughs> I'll tell a little bit about uh, the beginning of the field here. Um, was that actually it's, it's important, I guess, you know, in terms of that context uh, about the kibbutz because, um, because of the ideology of the beginning of the kibbutz and everyone works together. Uh, it was very much of a, a working ideology. And uh, even in the schools, the kids would learn how to work through, uh, they had their own gardens and, uh, at the school. And they also had a little petting zoo and the children are responsible for taking care of all the animals and milking the goats and, you know, and whatever. And um, so a lot of times what happened back then is, is that, you know, like in any school, there are the problem kids who just can't get along in, in the classroom and no one knows what to do with them. Send them off to the zoo. And that's what they did. And then all of a sudden they found out that the, that the children were acting different, they're behaving differently, uh, they're becoming more interested in the school subjects because they had to measure out the food, so they had to do the arithmetic, for instance. Uh, they were learning responsibility and having fun doing it. And it became, they become much more regulated, and then they became admired by all the other kids because they knew so much about the animals. And so when a lot of these, you know, kibbutz kids grew up, and their friends were going, or they're, you know, they were made to feel better by going to the kibbutz zoo. 
and they you know, either grew up, had a college education, some went to education, some went to psychology, and they're saying, wait a second, we're now living in the city, but there's nothing like that. We need it. So they started um, getting together and talking with each other. The first petting zoo in a school in Israel was by somebody who grew up on a kibbutz. And now there are many, many schools around the country that have a petting zoo as part of the school. Oh, that's so cool. And uh, then there's a psychologist who decided that, you know, in her psychology practice, she, she had goats there and, and, and dogs and bunny rabbits and, and birds and uh, whatever. And it was just natural for her because that's the way she grew up. Yeah. And so these people started getting together and talking with each other and started having meetings at the zoology department um, in T University of Tel Aviv, and they got encouragement from the head of the zoology department, who was really into the uh, human-animal bond, mm -hmm. and he was in contact academically with people like uh, Alan Beck, Philip Arco, and different, you know, one of the, some of the, the uh, most amazing people in the field of the human-animal bond. He actually went to the States and was together with him there. He came back and he said, okay, let's do it. Let's start up this, uh, this new profession. And I was lucky enough, they started talking about when well, we need to have training programs. And I was lucky enough to be in uh, the first group um, of the program that, you know, there are two programs that started together. I was in one of them that yeah. started teaching animal assisted psych psychotherapy. And that came up from that whole history. And I just lucked out that I was, you know, at the right place at the right time, heard about it, somebody told me about it. And I went, oh, okay, I have to drop everything and go do that. Because my whole, I grew up with animals. I mean, one of my big brothers was my dog. I and mean, that's the way I, you know, I was. And I had a rescue raccoon who slept in bed with me at night. I love and, that. I love that story. You might need to tell talk a little bit more about the story of your pet raccoon because raccoons oh, are known for being kind of vicious. So, no, she was so amazing. It's like she was extremely curious, and I refused to keep her in a cage. And she was destroying everything in the house. So I lived near a, a small woods, and so we said, okay, if she wants to go, she'll go. If she wants to stay, she'll stay. But we'll, we open up the door. And she was only allowed in the house at night. Now, first she disappeared, and I was really upset. Freddie went and she disappeared. Uh, but we left the door open just in case. And then um, upstairs, I was in about 10 o'clock in the area, we were boom, 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 boom. She was walking up the stairs, jumped on the bed, and went to sleep. Oh. And then uh, I taught her that if she wants to be in the house, she's got to stay on the bed. And she learned it within one night. And uh, then when she, um, we would let her out in the morning, her whole day was spent, you know, scheming how she was going to get back in the house again. <laughs> I would take, you know, I was 16, I just got my license, you know, she'd be in the car with me and she'd be on my shoulder and I opened the window and, you know, she'd put her head out like a dog and people would stop at a, at a light and go, what? <laughs> crazy. Yeah. But I think, you know, besides my dog and, you know, my raccoon and I raised, you know, any, any little baby bird that fell out of the nest in my neighborhood. From the time I was about 10, 11 years old, everyone, oh, bring it to Nancy. Nancy will know how to, what to do about it. <laughs> and I raised, you know, lots of little baby birds. And um, that was before the days that people didn't realize that you could just put the birds with fall out of the nest. You can put them back in the nest. And that everyone should know. It's not, it's just not true that if uh, a person touches a baby bird that you can't put him back because the mother won't accept it. It's not true. That's a myth. That's, I'm so grateful that you said that because so in almost that. 41 years of age, I still thought that like, if you touch the baby birds, that the mom- Most people think that. Yeah. I'm Most people think that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Now, now we all get to know, everyone watching this video that didn't already know that now knows that you can rescue yeah. the baby birds and put yep. them back in the nest for the mama bird. It's so funny that you brought that up because I went and I did seated chair massage in a hair salon today because I'm also yeah. nervous for people who don't yeah. know. And um, the man that runs the salon, it's, 
uh, he brought in a box and I was joking with him. I'm yeah. like, bring cake. I love cake. And he's like, no, I, they're, they're baby birds. And I was like, what? I was like, can I hold them? <laughs> and he's like, yes. And so I took, I put him in the back for him because he, he was holding a lot of things and he was opening up the shop. And, and so I, I slid the, the thing back so I could see. Yeah. And there's these three little baby birds in there Aww. because he said that like the mom never came back. Yeah, I don't know if she like that happens a car or, like ran into a window or like right. other reasons right. happened. It depends on what the situation is. He adopted these three baby birds. They're like this big. <laughs> and well, the thing is, is that they're around the kibbutz. Whenever anyone sees me with a box, I go, "Oh, what type of bird is in it?" I'm so <laughs> used to be around here. <laughs> No, yeah, I, yeah. I love that. Yeah. And he's like bottle feeding these like random wild baby birds. And oh, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. It's, but my, my most amazing experience with animals growing up was with my horse. Ooh, and I can so never talk weird. about the field without mentioning baby doll. Yeah. Baby doll was a horse that I got when I was nine years old. I had it for 11 years. Um, my parents said they were willing to get a horse for me. And back then, I don't know how it is now, but back then they would drive from stable to stable with a bunch of horses in a truck and, and try to sell them. And I got, on, I got on this horse and she promptly threw me. And somebody said, oh no, that would be much too dangerous for Nancy. She's obviously been severely abused. And then somebody says, but look, she's not scared of Nancy. Uh, she's not running away from Nancy. I went, oh, she's not scared of me. She's scared of everyone, but not of me. And I said, okay, she's mine. I'm not going to let anyone else get their hands on her. No one is, you know, back then, you know, you had to break a horse. Yeah. A horse behaved, you broke the horse. No one is going to get a hold of this horse. And I just decided my mission for the next 11 years till she died was that she would know no more fear yeah and like i said that was a mission for the next 11 years and she was with me like a puppy dog and it took her a few years to calm down with anyone else uh she must have been so severely abused by a man because until the day she died she only what let one man near her sorry by the way if my computer moves a little bit that's this guy's fault yes tell us tell us about that one. Oh, uh, his name is damage because he does so much damage in my house. When I first brought him home, he, okay, he loves being kissed and massaged. Um, is the first thing he did, I brought him home and he proceeded to go to my laptop and, and throw all the keys for my keyboard off the keyboard. <laughs> and then he tried to, to uh, take apart the, uh, the wire to the electricity. But okay, name is damage. That's it. <laughs> That's funny. So and yes, but he's a it's a sweetie pie. And uh, another warning: uh, you learn things as you go along. Uh, he's wonderful and sweet. He can also is you know he's wonderful with me, less wonderful with other people. But um, he does not get along with other cockatiels. And I actually brought him because I had a pair and the male died. So I wanted another male for my female, for Molly. And um, he wasn't interested in her at all. Turns out he was raised from an egg. Now with hand feeding birds, you should never raise them from an egg because they don't imprint on other birds. Interesting. And which means that if I'm not home, he's alone. You know, they may be my dog and the other animals or whatever, but as far as, as, far as he's concerned, he's alone. And uh, it's an ethical problem. And I don't quite know what to do about it, but if I put him in a place where he'd be with other birds all the time, it wouldn't help. Yeah. So that's an interesting yeah. problem. And then you also so have a, your dove and then you have your rats. And you were talking oh, about, let me, about the dove. Let me take out. And that, that oh, they're sleeping too. right now. Let's see if I can wake them up a little bit. They're sleeping. I put the cage right here so that I could show you my babies. I know how much you love to introduce them. I didn't want us to miss out on the Oh, yeah. 
they, they're a wonderful animal that they have a bad name that they don't deserve. This is Mooney. Hello, Mooney. And they, ha they, make, they have the most amazing personalities. They're cuddly, they're playful. They can be very silly. They can, you know, you'll make a move, they'll, they'll you know, I can, I can with, with an, another one here, let's see. Yeah, tell us how you um, use them in your clinic with the kids and the therapy well, you do for the animals. Just to say, this is Rona Corona. Rona Corona. Rona Corona, because she was born in April at the beginning of uh, the COVID. <laughs> it's my name, the Rona Corona. The love, the kids love it. That's funny. And then I also have Sunny, but she's sleeping right now. Uh, Sunny and Mooney and Rona Corona. Sunny, the big old fat. Um, yeah. Yeah. She's, she's like she twice was, as big as the other rats, you guys. Okay, um, so just another word about the ethics, because I you know since I brought it up, um, part of the animal psychotherapy is the strong ethical base that we have. Um, in our, the code of ethics from our organization, um, we have, it's like a three-branched code of ethics. There is the code of ethics that every, every therapy field, ha field has, for the clients, how to be act ethically towards the client. We also have to ab obviously act ethically towards the animals. Uh, it's not only a matter of proper food and proper space, but giving them the attention that they need, the proper attention, keeping them safe, um, making their life a good life. Um, and the third branch is the ethics of what happens between the client and the animal. Because there are those interactions that happen all the time, and it's it's part of it's. I use it as an intervention, even that's what I, I'm. That's uh, in our, in my, my next article that I want to write is using ethics as an intervention. Um, it's I've heard of uh, therapists, and I'm, I'm sad to say I've even known known one that uh, an animal physical therapist. I have to say, sometimes the animal has to suffer for the good of the therapy for the kid. You go, no, no, no. Yeah, that's crazy. And it's not only is it not ethical, and you know, I'm sort of walking a fine line, depending who am I talking about, t talking with. If I'm talking with somebody who doesn't really, you know, care about animals, that they couldn't care less. So I turn my argument a little bit to the side, and I go. Listen, if the kid hurts an animal and they know it, that's unethical towards the client because then they get a, a self-image of I'm somebody who hurts other people, who hurts animals. Yeah. And then they have the guilt or you know, whatever goes along with it. So for instance, um, I had a client. I, I worked for 19 years in an emergency shelter for children taken out of the home by emergency court order. I worked in residential group homes for many years. Um, I worked at a daycare center for children who were very, very much at risk. They were there by court order. They were still living at home, but there are a lot of suspicions of what might be going on. And I have my private clinic. And, and so this is the kid that uh, was taken out of the home because of, uh, um, because of uh, severe abuse mm. and uh at that point he was already about well maybe about uh, 14 years old and i'm sort of I'm, I'm i'm hesitating because i'm trying not to give the exact uh the, the exact details of who the kid is so i'm changing exactly where he was and all the things like that but it, it still makes the same image he had been severely abused uh, by uh, his uh, his father. Um, it was father was a, a single parent, raising him. Uh, but he also reported himself to the welfare, which is very rare. Yeah, because he loved the child very much, and he was scared of what he was doing to his son. And so the son came, and he was in therapy with me, and. Um, he loved animals, amazingly loved animals. Matter of fact, if I had the part of animal assisted psychotherapy, the way we practice it here in Israel, 
is we have a number of animals because you met my cockatiel, uh, you met my rats, I have hamsters, and I have my dog. And then, you know, well, you know, I go with all these guys, you know, into therapy. And part, part of it, animal system psychotherapy, is the interaction between the animals. You've got the interaction between the, uh, the client and the therapist, obviously, mm -hmm. which is what you have, you know, any other therapy. But then you have my relationship with the animals, and I have a different relationship with each animal. Sure. The client has a different relationship with each animal. But then the animals also have relationships with each other. So if psychotherapy is based on relationships, well, usually there's one relationship in the room. Gee, I've got a million relationships going on. It's a real laboratory of, of relationships that are going on. Anyway, um, he, for instance, if both the rats and the hamsters were out at the same time, and the rats, they're cute and wonderful with us, and the great friends with my dog, but they will eat hamsters. No, no question about it. It's an automatic reaction. That's their nature. He would get to the hamster and save the hamster before I do. Mm. And he adored, there was a dog at the shelter that he absolutely adored. And sometimes that was the only way that he could calm down. But he was also an animal abuser. He said, how could that be? He was a serial cat abuser. He would abuse them until death oh, wow. in his neighborhood. And how does that go together? And then he, um, he loved the dog, yet everyone, all the child care workers and the other children knew that whenever he was anywhere near the dog, uh, they, had to, they had to keep eye on him because he would try to poke his fingers in the, in the dog's eyes and close the nostrils so he couldn't breathe. And he loved the dog dearly. So one of the child care workers asked him, you love Nella, Nella's the name of the dog, you love Nella so much, why are you hurting her? And he said, what's the connection? Wow. Because if you remember, his, um, his father loved him very much, but also hurt him. And so after, you know, three or four months in therapy, he started trying, especially connected with the rats, especially, and the rats adored him. They would see him walking in the room, they jumped to the door of the cage and they wanted out because he was there. Well, then he decided to try to scare them and he thought it was funny. Now I had to stop him from scaring them because they don't deserve to be scared. Yeah. And I always say at the beginning of, of every, um, with every new client, you know, you do the therapy, therapeutic uh, um, contract, and no one gets hurt here. And I say, fear is also being hurt. You're not allowed to even scare the animals. And so finally, the rats didn't want to be anywhere near him. And he was really upset, because why don't they want to be near him? And I said, because they, and they said, they're, he's not running to you, but they won't come to me. I said, because they have the right not to be frightened. And he was very confused by it. And then we talked about it for a while. And then he, they sometimes let them go home for the weekend. He went home for the weekend and he came back and said, guess what happened this weekend? And I thought maybe you went to the beach or to an amusement park or something. He said, my father tried to hit me and I ran away. Turns out it hadn't even occurred to him when his father was trying to hurt him, was beating up on him, that he could run away, that he didn't deserve it. He didn't have to stay there. And that he learned from the rats and from me and my approach. And you know, I, you know, somebody might say, no, it's good for him to work through what he went through by watching the fear and going, no. And exactly the opposite happened was that he realized because they deserved not to be scared. He also deserved not to be scared and not to be hit. Yeah. And he did something about it. And then he went to this whole thing of, oh no, they'll never, they'll never want to be near me again. And I said, I don't know, let's work on it and see what happens. And sure enough, they eventually forgave him 
and he worked on it. He was his patience was amazing, and they came back to him. And then I had a conversation. You know what? Do you think you want kids one day? Yes, of course. How do you think you're going to react to your kids? Well, how are you going to behave with your kids? And after this whole conversation, he said, no, I'm never going to hit my kids. He said, you know what? I, oh, we, oh, we forgot to mention. Um, what we talked about, you know, why he wanted uh, to scare the rats. He said, because I know very well what fear feels like but I need to see what it looks like from the outside. Hmm. And so, because we were talking about it and you know, this all, you know, all these processes happening, all of a sudden he says, I don't think I need to hurt cats anymore. Because for the first time he was able to talk about the fear yeah. and talk about the hurt, learn that he could do something about it and talk about his experiences. He didn't need to reenact anymore on the cats. And so to all the therapy community, I'm going, wow, do you see what I was able to do for this kid and how he's changed? And they saw the change in him at the shelter. And to all the animal people going, yay, I saved a lot of cats. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to know who you're talking to to make the right argument, but there's a link. Yeah. There's a link between uh, between animal use and child abuse, a very strong link. And matter of fact, that link has helped me discover children in, in my, even in my private practice that were being abused because they were telling me about their animals. Yeah, that makes sense. And what was happening. And then I was able to talk about, him, about it even more. And um, matter of fact, what I found in my practice is a lot of kids have opened up to me from normative families where there's no suspicion. And I started talking to my colleagues and said, yeah, it happens to me too all the time. And I talked to a friend of mine who's a social worker, said, oh, I wish it would happen to me once. I'm like, what? And then I'm starting to talk to more and more people. And I realize that these kids are opening up more to us than they are to other therapy professionals. Because you're partnering with animals. And partnering with the animals, I'm showing, as I said, ethics as a therapy in intervention. Um, it also has to do with what's called the therapeutic alliance. Uh, it, it's that connection of trust. You know, when adults, you talk about therapeutic alliance, it's the uh, feeling of trust in the relationship. It's the, um, the uh, agreement on goals and agreement how to get to the goals. You talk to these kids, they have no goals. And they have you know, way to get to their goals if there are goals, but they need the trust. And a lot of these kids do not trust adults and they're right in their experience. They have no reason to trust adults whatsoever. Why should they trust me? Yeah. A therapist goes, you can trust me. I'm here for you. And they go, uh-huh. I've heard that before. Yeah. But when I say that, it's like they see it because the animals trust me. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. Is and I've had a kid, of it I've had a kid who's really in therapy for a year and a half before me. And he never opened up about anything. With me, within a month, he was talking about the abuse of his animals. With another month, he was telling me about the abuse he was going through at home. And asked, oh, he also met, said, I'm not going to talk to you. That was the first meeting. I'm not going to talk to you. And um, I know this is therapy and I didn't talk to my last therapist. And I'm not going to talk to you. And I was warned. <laughs> I was warned about that. And uh, then at the end of two years, there was a whole lot of change in the family because he opened up. A lot of work was done. And then they had to, they moved to another community. And so I, you know, couldn't do therapy with them anymore. And I asked them, uh, I said, I reminded him, I said, I remember when you first came to me, you said you wouldn't talk to me and then you never stopped talking. And he laughed and he laughed. And I said, so why did you tell me all these things? Why did you tell me about what was happening at home when you didn't tell the other therapist? And um, he said, because I saw the animals trusted you, I thought I could trust you too. Mm. I heard that same sentence in, in different forms from different kids. And about four or five years ago, I started 
going into a, a new a new branch, I would say, of neurobiology, which is really strange because when I was in high school, I hated, I was scared, more, I guess more correctly, scared to death of anything with math or, or science, and I stayed away from it as much as I possibly could. And when all the stuff about the neurobiology, the human-animal bond started coming up, that being with animals brings down cortisone, and brings up oxytocin, um, I went, okay, we'll leave that to the young ones. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm an oldster right now and let the young ones get into it. I don't have to do everything. But then I just became curious and I said, wow, this is, stuff is amazing. And oh, come on, damage, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> damage keeps on top of the computer. He loves to sit on, he's loved to sit on the edge of my computer, yes. Um, but, um, Oh gosh, okay, where was I? Damage you, you um, confused me there a bit. Okay, okay, so what I was talking about is the trust was that there's something called, um, uh, in the neurons, our actual neurons and neural systems actually are constantly looking out, bypassing anything cognitive, looking out into the environment. Is it safe or is it dangerous? It's called cues of safety. We all are constantly looking for cues of safety on a neurological level. Yeah. It's nothing to do with cognitive intention, okay? So what these kids basically are doing is they see the animals run to me if they're scared. Mm. They come to me when they need help. Yeah. They trust me. So they, they're cute neurologically. They're cues of safety for these kids who desperately need safety, but they, they haven't experienced it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm not telling them they can trust me. The animals are telling them they can trust me. And so I did research. I, you know, at you know, my advanced stage, I went back to school and did a master's in social work in order to study this. And I did find out by working with children, boys in uh, residential group, uh, group settings, uh, boys from age uh, seven to 11, mm -hmm. who have uh, severe attachment problems, avoided attachment. You know, you can't get these kids into therapy. Uh, they're refusing or they're dropping out of, uh, of therapy like crazy. And I know they were coming to me. One of these places I was working at, they sent all the most resistant kids to me. And with me, they were like putty in my hand. <laughs> oh, when, yeah, when, when's Wednesday? Because we have to go to Nancy on Wednesday. Is, she, is it Wednesday yet? <laughs> yeah, and so um, it, sure enough, among avoidant, these avoidant kids, the Therapeutic, attach, a ther a therapeutic Alliance, was uh, was established earlier and stronger in animal assisted psychotherapy than in other types of psychotherapy. Can you speak and, a little bit more about um, attachment theory for people out there who don't necessarily okay. know about like ancient, anxious attachment versus the avoidant versus the okay. attachment? Okay. Um, we're born, and I'm going to go into the neurobiology stuff now. That Do I it. We it. love it. We love the neurobiology. Yeah. Okay. Um, neurobiologically, our brains are wired for attachment, for, for connection, for relationships. We can't live without it. Um, there was research done right after World War II in the Romanian uh, orphanages, finding out that, you know, there's so many kids in orphanages right after the war, that children that were fed well, kept warm, proper clothing, and getting sick and dying for no obvious reason. And the research started to show because there was be, you know, one woman for, you know, 20 kids, 20 babies trying to take care of them. Uh, they have movies of, you know, it's like, you know, eight or nine little, you know, little toddlers or babies sitting in chairs and they're stuffing their mouths like this, you know, you know, spoonful, spoonful, spoonful. They couldn't even swallow. And they were getting another spoonful because they had to finish quickly. And there was no time for play, no time for hugging. 
and you can't survive that way. Yeah. Um, and so that's where the theory of attachment originally came from. You needed to grow. We had this one little girl in the shelter that she was so tiny. She was, she was 10 years old, but she looked like she was six. They took her to the doctor. They thought she had problems with growth hormones. The doctor said, hug her a lot. And when the, in the few months she was there, she just shot up growth lines. Wow. We need for regulation. We need, obviously, for food and clothing, but a lot more than that. We need it when the baby, cr you know, when we cry, it goes, oh, to mirror our emotions and be there for us. Yeah. And that's the beginning of attachment. But if you get parents that um, they themselves had problems when they're growing up, they don't know how to be good parents, they don't know, the, the crying bothers them, oh, stop crying and, you know, hit the little kid for crying. It's like the kid in the shelter who, um, I'll never forget, I was, um, I happened to be, you know, in the room and the kids were running around and one kid started crying and the childcare worker went up to him and kneeled down and said, what's wrong? And the kid went smash in the, in the child care worker's face. Turns out he was a six year old. Turns out that whenever he cried, he was beaten. Mm. So as far as he's concerned, he was just defending himself. How could a kid like this be, be properly emotionally attached to an adult when they need help? Yeah. And, and so, um, person, needs for needs to have a secure base a place that they can grow from and a secure place and a safe haven where they can if they're scared they can go back it's like a kid if you see movies of they did all sorts of movies for attachment to try to figure out what types of attachment kids had but the healthy attachment was you know get a little kid with a stranger or, you know the, the mother's there and a stranger and the kid wants to explore the room. So their one hand is on the mother's knee and the other is reaching out looking for a toy. And slowly the child can, can go further away. But then something happens to make the child scared. Maybe a sudden movement by the stranger goes running back, mommy, 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 are you here? And the mother cut it. And what's actually found out is that an animal can be in therapy, and not in therapy, a safe base from which somebody can explore, and a safe haven when somebody's scared to go back to the animal for a hug. And I've seen that in the therapy a lot. When kids bring up really difficult content, they might go to my dog and just one 13-year-old boy was like one foot in the criminal world already. He came out with some amazing emotional stuff that he hadn't dared come out with before. And then he went to my dog and lied down in a fetal position around my dog and just hugged her. Mm. He needed that. And then afterwards he could go on. So um, the avoidant attachment, um, it's, Kids don't dare. They, you know, they avoid connection because they can't trust it. And then there's the anxious attachment, which is like when a, a kid comes running up to you, they've never seen you in their lives. You've never seen them. They come running up to you and hug you and go, I love you. And there are, you know, they call it pleasing and fawning. And if you don't know what to talk about, oh, the kid sees something wonderful in me. But no, it's inappropriate. They can get into a lot of trouble. Yeah. So those are, you know, the two different types of attachment. And what Bowlby said, uh, uh, John Bowlby was the creator of the um, attachment theory, which now almost everything, all studies in child, you know, has something to do with attachment periods. He said back in the 80s, there has to be a neurological base for this. There has to be. They eventually found out that there is. And all the neurologists are quoting Bowlby. It's, it's wonderful. It really is. How do you see that presenting in adults? So we talked about kids, um, but they, do you ever see adults for the animal assisted therapy and working with attachment there? Therapy? Okay. I, um, I work with the parents doing uh, a parental counseling. Um, but I think 
I had two amazing um, examples, and I'll go into detail on one of them because I have permission from the mother to say that. Okay, so I have permission. Where uh, she was there because her, her child, her, her, uh, her son was gang raped. Yes, and uh, she, um, she was only interested in her son. She didn't want to talk to anyone, and I was warned to be careful of her. She'll, uh, uh, she won't agree to any connection with you. She's impossible and all that. And I tried calling her to, you know, as a social worker, I tried calling her to um, make an appointment with her. And I said, and I'm looking forward to meeting you. You're never going to get to know me. I went, okay. <laughs> so then I was told that, um, uh, Okay, she came here and I went out to the waiting room and I found her sitting on the couch, but leaning over to the floor, hugging my dog. And I said, hi, that's Mushu. I'm Mushu's mom. Come on, let's go. And she just sort of do, 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 do after me. And this woman who I was warned that she wouldn't be there for 10 minutes, which I usually try to spend an hour with the parents, I had a scraper out of the room at the end of the hour. And I, we created such a connection because of that, that I ended up by doing therapy with her. She's the only adult that I've ever done therapy with. And, you know, she, uh, she attributes it to the animals that I had and the amazing things that came out in therapy. And she totally, and totally, totally uh, attributes that the animals. Once we had to go to uh, a meeting with the uh, local social work department that came to the shelter for what was going to happen after the kid left the shelter. And she said, I'm not going to the meeting. I said, yes, you are. You're the mother. She said, no, 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 I can't. I always end up by yelling and screaming and everyone gets mad at me. I went, listen, I will sit on one side of you. Mushu will sit on the other side of you and you'll be just fine. She was so scared. We came out of a, um, we came out of a staff meeting right before, you know, this meeting, and I found her on the floor in a um, fetal position on the floor with Mushu. I said, it's time. And we, she got up. I was on one side, Mushu was on the other. And she was amazing. And the social workers were looking like, what did you do to her? <laughs> <laughs> Treated her and that was, without that was, a, <laughs> that was a few years ago. And to tell you the truth, we're still in contact. She is one amazing woman. She's so special. Yeah. She's so warm. But she never let anyone see that before. Through, through me and Mushu and the baby bird that was, you know, I was raising at the time, who was now 11 years old and flying around my house. Um, she started trusting other people. Yeah. And knowing she needed help and agreeing to that. It was just, wow. It was, it was amazing. And then another mother who, you know, I just, I was working with her, you know, it was a matter of uh, severe neglect, but I was working her with her kids and that was fine and whatever. And then we had, you know, the same type of meeting with the social workers from the community. And again, they said, what did you do to her? I went, what are you talking about? I said, oh, no, but she's never cooperative and she never listens. And then I remembered that a couple of weeks before, she just mentioned to me, oh, you're different. You're an animal person. You're just plain different for all the rest. That's a therapeutic alliance for both of them. Yeah. And it's so strong. And without the therapy alliance, you're not going to do therapy. So that, that's my, and also I've had parents, you know, come in and, and they said they didn't necessarily get along with other therapists for the kids, but with me, they do. And I'm sure, I'm sure it works, you know, in many ways that I'm not always aware of. Um, but the trust is there. It's amazing. Yeah, no, that's and a then if, important part of it. If, if I can find more kids, that are going through things in the normative families. Uh, we know, do you know about the ACE studies? 
The ACE studies. Tell us about the ACE studies, Nancy. Okay, adverse child experience studies that they found out that if they've got, you know, thousands and thousands of subjects that belongs to the, uh, it was a study done, it's still going on for past like, you know, over 20 years from the Kaiser uh, Health Insurance Company in California, mm -hmm. where uh, everyone getting the insurance has to fill out um, this questionnaire about 10 different possible experiences they had in childhood. And uh, whether it be um, psychological, physical, sexual abuse, uh, severe neglect, somebody in the family with mental illness, somebody in the family who's in jail, somebody who's uh, addicted to, uh, to drugs, to alcohol, um, even a divorce in the family, okay? If someone has at least six of those experiences, uh, their chance, it's a very high chance that they will die 20 years earlier. Oh yeah, I had normal life studies. I just forgotten what they were called. Yeah, and um, people need to open up. And many, many of these people said, this is the first time I was ever able to open up. Yeah. And they have to open up and work it through when they're children. We have to find them. In the emergency shelter, you know, it's, it's everywhere. We had um, a, a lawyer and a, a professor and uh, a dentist and all sorts of professionals. I worked with a clinical psychologist who uh, had, was severely abusing her son. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's everywhere. It's in every status. And, and I just feel that with the animals, and let's talk about why, not only the therapeutic alliance, you know, if we're talking about the field. <laughs> yes, definitely. Which, uh, projection. The projection, a lot of these kids, neurobiologically, they cannot project onto a doll. They're not at that cognitive level. There's something that, that get, getting in the way of symbolism. Neurobiologically, they're not able to symbolize. But you have the animal in the room, and the animal is alive. The animal runs around. There's movement. There, yeah. They eat. Uh, they have babies. They get sick. They die. I've got Sunny and Mooney here. I'm taking them in next week for operation for cancer. Um, and then it reminds, it reminds kids, you know, there's, there's the sound, there's the smell. And it, it brings up issues. And they're just, they're just talking about the animals. When in reality, they're talking about themselves. Yeah. Um, the kid, uh, kid, mirror neurons, I don't know if, how much... You've heard about, everyone talks about mirror, mirror neurons is the basis of empathy, but not only. How do we understand other people's intentions? Because we see movement in other people. We know that if we were to make that movement, then we would be feeling such and such. And so that's what they must be feeling. You can't do that with a doll, but with animals, you can. I've had a number of kids where they, you know, they, they have ascribed intentions to my animals. And I never argue. They may be 100% wrong. Like one day my dog was sleeping and they said, oh, look at how sad she is. And I go, oh my gosh, I didn't notice. I'd love to say kids understand animals so much better than adults. Why do you think she's sad? And then she went into her whole life story, which she'd never been able to talk about before. Yeah. And her relationship with her parents, but she was talking about the dog, how much the dog missed the mother and hadn't had a hug from her mother. It was just, and it, it, it was crazy. And then after a lot of working you know, through the animals, well, you know, it's sort of like me. Yeah. And I've had so many kids talk about things that they could never talk about because first it started with the animals. And it's sometimes it's crazy the degree to which it works. The only problem is if it in some way hurts the animal. We walk a very, very fine line sometimes. The projections, you've got to be very careful that the animal has no idea that they're projecting. You know, they'll accept it with, you know, they don't care. They don't understand. 
Um, and as long as they, you know, they earn a great time with the kids because of it, that's wonderful. But for instance, I had one kid who was running after um, my bird. She wanted, she wanted to be with it. Molly, who's the, the sweet cockatiel. Uh, she, and she started hiding behind the cage. It's, oh, she's playing hide and seek with me. I'm going, no, she's not playing hide and seek. She's scared. Yeah. And she says, oh, I know why she's scared. Because in the store where you bought her, because she he has a need to see me as the good mother. We like Kohut. Kohut believes in the good mother. <laughs> um, not with you, but before before she met you in the store. The man in the store, he touched her, you know, down there below. And that's why she scared of me. He had been sexually abused. Yeah. But could never talk about it. But he talked about it with Molly. So I have to do it in a way that I stop the dangerous behavior for the animal, show empathy towards the animal, keep showing empathy towards the kid. I don't say, no, no, don't ever do that. No. I will not go into, it's not a lesson in animal behavior. I'm not going to sit there in a long lecture, how do we know, because she, her feathers are this way, and her head is this way, and her crest is this way. No, I turn it back. Sometimes I say, have you ever felt what the animal felt just now? Like I stop anything that might hurt the animal. Then I turn it back, have you ever felt that way before? Wow, some of the stuff that the kids come up with. I always focus it back to them. Yeah. And, you know, you can't plan these things ahead of time. They happen. They just might happen. This is why I like, especially with, with these kids the, who've been through a lot, the psychodynamic. That's what I do. The psychodynamic means I go with the flow where the kid takes me. I don't plan anything. And it, don't plan anything ahead of time. Yeah. Psychoeducation can be great and talk about, oh, yes, then we're going to teach the kid uh, uh, social, proper social behaviors and, you know, through working with the animals, that's great. But uh, then you're not going to get what happened below. Like maybe, oh, we're going to help the kid with the self-esteem. I don't work on self-esteem issues, no matter how bad they are. But maybe the kid has bad self-esteem because he was sexually abused. And if you only work on the self-esteem, you're not going to get there. Right. You know, oh, the dog loves you and you being on the horse makes you feel strong and capable. And that's, that's wonderful. But the goals are different. And for each of the different interventions, they're all important. All the different animal assisted interventions are important extremely important. Not one intervention is more or less important than any other, but they have different goals. Yeah. I look for the stuff underneath. They have different types of training. Um, different types of training for the animals. I don't want it. And my dog has been through no training whatsoever. I want her natural behaviors. I like to say, I don't want a, a therapy dog with me. I want a dog with me in therapy. Yeah. Um, that's a good, that's, that's a, our approach here. So I feel like it, like, are there some differences culturally coming from the United States growing up in Massachusetts versus in Israel? Um, now I'm trying to think. I would imagine there would be, but you've been over there, there for a while. In a way there is, um, but so much of Israeli culture um, today at least, is very much based on American culture. Ah. Uh, so in terms of therapy and how, I'll tell you what, with the animals, um, Israel's come a long way in terms of their approach towards animals in general. When I first came here back you know, in the 70s, who would ever hear of a dog being kept inside the house and they were throwing the, you know, the, the scraps of the chicken bones? And I was so upset. <laughs> but now you know, things really have, really have changed. And it's much, much like it is in the States. Um, I'm aware of a lot of, I guess, 
and I'm going to tread very lightly here. Um, I don't, I don't want to get into politics. That's not what no, I'm into. No politics. No Pol politics. Talk, just, talking um, about the culture is different than talking about the politics, I feel like. Right. Okay. Is, um, I think if you get, okay, this is the cultural thing. You've got the ultra-religious, and this is similar to also with the Muslim culture. Yeah. Where in, 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 uh, in Hebrew, you say it's not kosher. They're not kosher animals. They're not allowed to be in the house. It's like a dog because it's not kosher. And I'm going, I'm not religious. So I go, what? You're not eating the dog, but you know, whatever. That's, that's the culture. The rabbi needs and, to come by and bless the dog before it can go in the house. What? So the rabbi needs to come by and bless the dog before. No, he no, no, no. It's just, <laughs> a lot of religious don't want them. And then they can't, you, you can't do animal assisted psychotherapy if you can't use the animals. I mean, you can do some like with goats because they're goats. goats for, you know, a lot of animals you can't. Um, but actually, to tell you the truth, when we were still trying to get recognition for the field here in Israel. Um, but. A friend of mine did um, her master. She went after she studied animal system psychotherapy. She also got a master's in uh, counseling. And she did her thesis research project on uh, religious, the religious um, culture and animal system psychotherapy. She was working in a religious place and they did let a dog in. It turns out that they got special dispensation from some rabbis because of what's called in Hebrew, pikuach nefesh, it means saving a soul. Mm. They recognize that the emotional benefit from the animals saves the soul of a child who has deep emotional problems. Okay, that's okay. That's beautiful. So that's, that's, a, that's the way they deal with it. Um, in the Muslim culture, and I know this because I have uh, many, many uh, Muslim friends, and I've had two, uh, I supervise students from the program. Uh, and the two, um, actually, um, I have some Muslim friend, but these are, these are two uh, Christian Arabs. But they were telling me how the whole approach towards animals is very different in, the, in general in the Arab world. And uh, so it's, it's a little bit different, the way you have to approach it. Yeah. Uh, and the sensitivities involved and the ethics involved. So you really have to be aware uh, of those. Yeah. You can, but in general, in therapy, they're talking you know, more and more about being culturally sensitive in the way that we do in therapy. So you know, just the cultural approach towards animals is, you know, is also going to be a part of it. Yeah. And I guess Did you ever um, have a problem coming in as an American and doing the work that you do in Israel? Um, well, uh, Americans are really accepted here, so it's easier. I think um, the Russians had more of a problem when the Russians started uh, moving unmasked into Israel when, when perestroika happened. Um, I think culturally, it was, it was a very, uh, very different issue. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, it was the Russians that brought in their great love for dogs that did a lot to change the approach towards dogs here in Israel. Oh, that's interesting. Every culture brings, brings something into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you have to be aware of it all the time. I studied, I think you mentioned at the beginning, uh, originally when, before I moved uh, to Israel, I was doing a doctorate in cross-cultural research methodology. Yeah. Uh, and so I've you know, become very aware with actually the person who began the field, uh, Harry Triandis, who just died about a year and a half ago. Wonderful, wonderful man. And he really opened up uh, a whole new world. I wanted it because I didn't know if I'd be able to move to Israel. I was going to do cross-cultural research between Israel and the States and the kibbutz. And that was my original idea. But then they sort of dropped the program when I was halfway through and I was told I was going to get a degree in ed psych. And I said, no, nope, not for me. But then I moved to Israel, so um, to the kibbutz, and that was fine. Um, I think another thing I'd like to bring up about animal assisted psychotherapy, with all if you're going to talk with the, the culture and the ethics, and listen, the average therapist 
has to be aware of the client, the client's feelings. They have to be with the client and outside of the client at the same time to understand to be the client feels felt and you know we're in with all the way but also be to analyze what are, you know things are going on in their mind and what's going on what should i say next and they also have to be aware of their own counter transference of what they feel towards what's going on so it's, it's that easy to be a, a psychotherapist we have to be aware of many more things yeah. we've got to be aware also of how the client is dealing with the animals how the client's feeling about the animals, how the animal's feeling about the client, what's going on in between them, how do I feel about the animals? What if somebody says, I wanna, oh, I wanna see that rat kill the hamster. I wanna see what happens. Yep, yeah, yep, yep. I've had it a few times. And am I angry at that kid? Oh my gosh. You know, how do I deal with that? We have to be super 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 multitasking at all times yeah they um, to get, like emotionally regulate and check your own triggers um so that you're not projecting your and exactly and uh yeah it's it's an interesting and i've got to be aware of everyone's needs and so many needs and all the yeah. transferences the, counter the animals have transferences yeah also because they remember another kid and so they're going to be you know a little bit Nervous of another kid who comes, you know, whatever. Sure. Whatever. And um, I did talk about the training here in Israel that we get, which is amazing. Um, it works a little different. I won't go into the whole story of why it's different, but you know, the laws are different here for psychotherapy. But um, our programs accept only people who have a BA in something like psychology, social work, uh, or special ed. Then the program is a three-year program to study animal system psychotherapy uh, with 1,100 classroom hours. And uh, the subjects uh, are, you know, regular psychology, um, psychotherapy for adults and for children. And, and a lot of times that, you know, the, the different programs, they might have psychodiagnostics and uh, Oh, you have to have uh, the prerequisites, obviously, psychopathology, a developmental psych, um, you know, different, different uh, prerequisites. And then I uh, study uh, about animal, animal science. We, there's a semester in basic vet science because we have to know how to take care of our animals. Yep. Animal behavior uh, and basic uh, zoo science. We call it because a lot of people work in zoos, in the small petting therapy zoos. Uh, then we have a couple of semesters of the human animal bond, studying the bond itself. We have, there's a course in special populations working with animals, with uh, at risk kids, autistic kids, uh, adults, you know, different, different areas there. Uh, then there, uh, of course, the ethics course. And then there's at least four semesters of the heart of the matter, putting all that together for the principles of animal assisted psychotherapy. Nice. And together with that 1,100 hours, there's also two hours a week of uh, group supervision, one hour a week of uh, individual supervision, clinical supervision, and 400 hours of work in the field, of a field placement, of which 260 hours are um, of direct client hours. That's a lot. And there's nothing like that anywhere else. So it's an amazing program uh, in order to become an animal assisted psychotherapist. Everywhere else in the world that I know of, first you have to be a licensed therapist, and then you add on the animal component later, and you can, there are different places. The University of Denver has, I think, um, with for an academic program, has, has the most of them, of course. I think in there, I think they have four courses. With, Na with their friend Nina Ekholm-Fry. 
whoever yes. also yes. her on this channel. Yes. <laughs> she's she's wonderful. I love her. She's a wonderful. And she's got lots of energy. <laughs> but yeah. she, all the energy goes into great places. She does. She's wonderful. She does. Highly okay. intelligent. Yeah. And, you know, so they, a therapist first, and then you become an animal psychotherapist. But we in Israel sort of, we grow. All the courses we take in, psych in, um, in psychotherapy, we were thinking of our field placement and how it fits in. And it's sort of a, it's different here because of that. I like it. It's harder to learn to be a ther psychotherapist and an analysis of therapist at the same time. Yeah. So much to think about, but there's so much supervision and so much talking about the difficulties that so much support in the programs, very personal, very personal, personal uh, journey. Did they work a lot with horses over there, or is it primarily the smaller animals? Well, like it's um, there's a lot of work with horses, but it's there's a big confusion here, a huge confusion, which we're trying to work on right now with therapeutic riding. It's a real problem where therapeutic you can have you know finish high school and go to a program for a year or two or something and be a uh, therapy writing instructor, which is great. But many of them, I'm sorry to say, consider themselves to be therapists. Mm. And they don't have the training. And then it's confusing. Yeah. Because then people come to them for therapy. They bring their kids to them for therapy. But they're not doing therapy. And, you know, in the best case scenario, so nothing, you know, nothing comes out of it. I had uh, one, again, I have permission to give the details on this one. A uh, 17 year old girl came uh, because of a severe, the, the most severe case of phobia that I, I'd ever seen. I've dealt, you know, quite a few times with phobia, and usually, you know, it goes, you know, once the kids are old enough, have the cognitive ability to go through uh, the program for getting over phobia, usually about, at least about 10 years old, then, you know, it goes really quickly. She's 17 and it just wasn't going away. And finally she was getting a little bit better, a little bit better. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I asked her, I said, what is it that makes you so frightened of Mushu? Um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The phobia was so bad that not only would she go visit her um, cousins that lived on a kibbutz, around the kibbutz, the dogs running around free, just like the kids, the dogs running around free too, no leashes. Um, she wouldn't go to the kibbutz because there are dogs running around. Too bad. She would go to a supermarket. If she by mistake went into the aisle where there was a dog food, she would get a major panic attack and run away screaming. Wow. That's, that's already a phobia. It's not just fear of a dog, it's phobia because it's already widening yeah. Um, and then the most dangerous is actually life-threatening. She lived in a, lives in a town up north where throughout the years there's been quite a bit of bombing from her neighbors to the north. And she, during bombing with the sirens, she preferred to stay in the street rather than knock on somebody's door in order to, for, to get into shelter. They because she was dogs. more scared that there might be a dog on the other side of the door wow. than she was of a bomb of a missile of a bomb hitting her like yeah a literal bomb it was it was wow. like it was really That's so anyways so i was asking her what do you think um would cause you know i said what what do you think she's going to do to you and she says i know she's not a, i mean mushu was a rug <laughs> she was a rug she was she was you know very quiet and slept most of the time because you know she was quite old at that point. Just I know she's not going to jump on me, and I know she's not going to bite me. I said, so what is it? She might try to smell me or lick me. So I said, okay, I have a question for you. Is she? I, are you scared of her, or is it disgusting? She said, oh, is she trying to smell me or lick me? It was so disgusting. I said, well, maybe it's a sensory problem. Now, what happened when she was eight years old, her mother 
took her to therapeutic writing just for, you know, a little bit to, you know, shore up her self-esteem and feeling of uh, abilities. And she told me that she never really liked dogs. That she wasn't, you know, scared of them. She just didn't like them. But when she went to the stables for the therapeutic writing, she didn't like being around the dogs that were running around. I said, oh, you've got a phobia. We know what to do for phobia. We're therapists. So they forced her for every single meeting with a horse. She had to, for 10 minutes, every week, pat a dog. And that created a phobia. Because they didn't, they didn't know what a phobia was. And they didn't know what to do for it. You don't do flooding. If someone has a phobia, you do not do flooding, emotional flooding like that. So that's the problem that we have here in Israel right now. And uh, very, very few equine assisted psychotherapists. And so there's somebody now in the field who's trying to do something about it. She's, uh, and, you know, she's working with my organization and becoming part of the organization to try to work with the authorities. The problem is somehow uh, therapy writing got recognized by the health department it's a type of therapy. And so now they refer everyone in, you know, the, and we're fighting that right now. That sounds like a big battle. But I think that's a general problem in general with animal assisted interventions is that there's, there's not much of a clear line between the different interventions that people really understand. To the point where I remember once seeing an ad for uh, come to the library with your child who's having problems reading, have them read to, do a, to, read, to, read to the, the library dog and that will be animal assisted therapy. Right, or equine assisted learning um, or animal yeah. assisted learning, but people don't actually have any background in education as practitioners. Exactly. Um, so it's, it's a like, mess. Yeah, it can kind of depend on what it like, what are you trying to teach somebody, right? Yeah. If it's education like academics um, versus is it education like horsemanship, right? And right. it's there are different aspects of that and not to invalidate other people, but just to no, 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 encourage people to um, have a better understanding of their intention and how much more they could facilitate what they're trying to have as an end result. First of all, if they know your goals. Scope of practice, it's a thing. Exactly. exactly. Now, I learned a lot about this because um, I spent a year and a half before the pandemic. <laughs> uh, I went to give a workshop uh, for Meg Kirby Make at her equine assisted is Institute. in Australia, for those of you who don't in know. Australia. You can also, you can also the interview with Meg Kirby and me on um, this YouTube channel um, to learn oh, the wonderful. Aboriginal yes. program. She's, she's an amazing person who gets it. She really is an amazing um, person. In terms of what is equine assisted psychotherapy. But I also learned a lot because they had, I can't remember, about 40 people came. And there were many equine assisted psychotherapists, but also many uh, equine assistant learning people. And what they explained to me that it's sort of like a spectrum where obviously in the learning, a lot of emotional content comes up because the horses bring out a lot of emotional issues with us. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it gets confusing. Am I doing learning? Am I doing therapy, psychotherapy, the emotional issues are coming up. And also, to tell you the truth, in psychotherapy with the animals, we end up by doing teaching, but that's not the focus. For instance, with somebody who will scare, you know, uh, one kid, you know, would go to the bars of the cage and go like this and scare the animal. And I, I would stop them and and say, well, he's scared, and explain he's scared, but then the focus goes back to the kids. Um, and, and you just have to be aware when you're, you know, working with one or the other, what are your limitations? What do you know how to do? You have to, um, I think you have to admit, you know, yes, there's emotional things. 
and let the, you know, you don't want to tell the client, I'm sorry, that's emotional. We're not going to deal with that. No, you have to let them come out with what they're feeling. Yeah. And then you might have to uh, refer them on. Like with that one girl with a phobia, I referred them on to an occupational therapist to work on sensory issues. It turns out she had a lot. Yeah. And it was stopping her from being assertive in different situations, which we also dealt with the assertiveness stuff that was going on with her. But be modest. Know what you don't know. Yeah. I think the other part of that is having the abundance mindset where it's just like, we might be really good at this and we could help somebody on a general level, but there's somebody else that specializes in something. And so to send that person to the specialist and create space for the next person to come in and see us, even if funding mm -hmm. is um, tight, you know, because just knowing yeah. you're looking at the whole person and not just having fear that you're not going to be able to meet your, um, your bills that month, you know? Yeah. It's, that yeah that's, a, that's, that's another issue. <laughs> the economic one, but I've had a few uh, occupational therapists recognize that the child's motor problems are actually emotionally based. And then they refer them to me, just like I have referred uh, some kids to occupational therapists. I love networking and collaborating. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, yes. And be modest. I think the more you know, you more you realize you don't know. And no, you don't have to be everything. You really don't. Yes. And then you get more respect for yourself, I think, when you understand what your own goals are. Respect the other professions and respect yourself more without saying it's all therapy. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like in coaching, for instance, uh, my business coach is always telling me like, you need to niche down, niche down. And I hear this from a lot of different coaches in the industry. And it's the same mm -hmm. thing in other professions as well to like really know who you're great at serving um, mm -hmm. and have faith that there are people that can, there's plenty of people for you to help in that realm. Right, um, right. And finding the other people that fold into that in collaboration. Um, and I think that when you niche down, instead of just being general, it helps to facilitate that process to know when to refer out to somebody else. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, oh, another thing we talk about a therapist, the animal is not the therapist. <laughs> We're the therapist. You know, I say, oh, my cold therapist, or, you know, I'm just helping the animal because the animal's a real therapist. The animal doesn't understand the goals. Or the methods. The animal is being him or herself. And that's what we want, the authenticity. Yes. Um, but we know. Beautiful space of authenticity. We, we do, yeah. It's another, another little tidbit. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Another little tidbit to think about. There's so much there. And Nancy, I really appreciate your time and everything that you've given us today. It has been such an incredible gift. What are some ways that you're wanting to collaborate with people in the world to further oh, your I love collaborating. Real? Listen, um, I love talking. Well, first of all, I love meeting people in general. I think you, you've got that so far. <laughs> um, I had a wonderful talk, I think it was last night, the night before last, with Veronica Lack. Oh, she's great. I interviewed her too. She's fantastic at the Herd in like, Florida. Yeah, she's a phenomenal person. In different, different uh, Zoom conferences or, you know, I know her, you know, she knows who I am. And, and we just said, we should talk. Yeah. And, you know, we had this, and, you know, also, no, we have to keep going. And, you know, with Meg and uh, Katarina Lundgren, which who she's, wow, I've learned so much from her. She's awesome. I can't wait to get her interview up, hopefully, uh, this week. It's still in the editing phase. Oh, I'm waiting. I, and, I know. You know so I, she's, I, yeah, I, I'm excited to get to collaborate with her and hopefully go visit, like, once the borders open up. And hopefully I can come see you in okay. Israel, too. Absolutely. I'm waiting. Um, but, you know, and, and there's a new book that came out, which people might be interested, uh, by Joe Silbert and Joe Frasca. It's uh, talking about um, an animal as... Um, a relational third and she asked me to to do an endorsement for the book and I, okay I'd never heard of her and whatever loved the book everyone has to get it nice we'll have and, to it when it comes and then I was you know, we just said no we have to talk and we connected up so much and like I'm meeting these people and it's like we're all talking wait we have to get together and form a group 
that because we're talking about like for instance it's all about the relationship we're not giving commands to our animals we have a relationship with them yeah it's our relationship relationship with animals and and then katarina when i was talking to her last night you know she was saying well it's a combination of relationship and the doing within the relationship and then we got into this wonderful conversation and the ideas are coming up and we're all talking about what are we going to you know do together and and inform this you know, at least for the type of therapy that you know we we enjoy doing and feel it's good you know for for our clients and it's an approach and there are many different approaches to therapy yeah but we're finding we're finding each other and that finding each other is is exciting because then we create dialogues that bring up ideas that we never thought about before and then we combine our ideas and come up with something new and right now that's the level of collaboration that that i'm doing and find so exciting and and uh you know it's not just one of us it's not um i've got the answer and the whole world has to listen but it's it's meeting people and growing from it and it's um uh stimulating each other yeah more and more absolutely and one of the ways that you can help stimulate people is your book so why don't you just hold up your book for a second yeah. for those of you okay. that are yeah you asked me to get ready so it's ready you can see what you're looking for when you try and find it, it. Yep. Uh, there it is oh. okay animal assisted psychotherapy and there's mushu there's Mushu down there. I didn't want myself when a friend of mine drew this. And um, yeah, that, but I said, no, you can draw Mushu. That's okay. <laughs> That's super sweet. And, and, and also damage does damage. And, and if you notice, I don't know if you can see the edges. Damage is the edges. part of the book for those of you who can't. Yeah, see a part of the book. Yes, he Right does. now. And so, uh, Nancy, thank you so much for your contributions to the field. Um, both through your book, your research, your articles, like the association, the Animal Assisted Psychotherapy Association that you've created there in Israel and helping that country like come forward more so um, in the world. You're doing it. And I want to add, you asked about collaboration. Yes, tell us. Uh, you're welcome to come to my Facebook just because I want input. I'm telling you, when I come up with an idea, you know, it's nice, wow, and that's great. Now, I, if you have more ideas to contribute and then we can get a conversation, I would love it. Any of you listening to this. Mm -hmm. And then I also have a face group uh, called the uh, Animal Assisted Psychotherapy and Interpersonal Neurobiology of Trauma Nerds. <laughs> oh my goodness. You, I think you should say that just a little bit slower for the people who are listening because that is both long and fantastic. <laughs> One more time, please. Animal Assisted Psychotherapy and interpersonal neurobiology of trauma nerds <laughs> there you go i'll make sure and write that all out in the description uh everyone that's out there i got i got the idea of nerds from sarah schlott who she also has some some i think a shirt that said you know neurobiology nerds or something so sarah, i stole that from her she's fantastic yeah. we'll hopefully have her on the show sometime in the future um she's you should yeah really amazing work um, and on that note, Nancy, who in the world inspires you today? Oh, who, wow, 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 wow. You know what? There's uh, two people, I would say. One, well, okay. There can be definitely be more First than of my, my animals and my clients. My animals and my clients. There's no, I dedicated my book to them. Uh, that's first of all. Uh, Victor Frankel, I don't know if you ever heard that name. I have. Wrote, uh, Man's, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I so much relate to that. This has given me so much meaning in life that if I can help more children that are leading horribly, horribly abusive lives, and I can help them, my focus is, my focus is the children. It's not the animal assisted psychotherapy. That's, that's the way to get to the children. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, Victor Frankl said, you know, meeting in life can save us. And it's certainly true for me. And Alan Beck was sort of a mentor for me. I, I don't know how many people have heard of him. 
is uh, one of the earliest experts in the human-animal bond. He's uh, been a mentor, an encouraging person. Uh, he's always there for me, and he gets it. And I need people like that around me. Oh, I do. Beautiful. I guess not the people. I love that so much. Yeah. Nancy, again, thank you so much for your time. It has been such an honor and a pleasure to spend this My afternoon pleasure. with you. So. Nice meeting you too. <laughs> <laughs> and for everyone out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so okay. I will have stuff in the descriptor. So anyone that would like to contact Nancy to ask her questions, to collaborate, to interview her, um, anything like that, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm very open to people, anyone, even think people are thinking studying it in any level. That's fantastic. Um, I'm I happy to. All right, everyone. Uh, here's to equines, equality, and equity in making the world a better place. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.